so that some folks might be joining us a few minutes late. That's what happens, right? And we're flexible with that. Um, we appreciate everyone being here today. If you do not know Dr. Chris Smith, you are in for a real treat. He is a friend of the TLPDC and the Teaching Academy, a true resource at Texas Tech. Dr. Smith is from the School of Music. I will let him tell you a little bit more about himself, but we really count on him at the TLPDC as a resource, um, not just for what he does with technology and teaching, but just as a friend and an advocate too. So I'm so, so privileged to welcome him today and to hear what he has to say. Chris? Thanks, Suzanne. Hi, everybody. I know most of you, but hello to all and hello to those I haven't met yet or those I've only met in the Zoom space, which is really quite disorienting in itself. The uh, This is the world we live in now. Um, i am got my own headphones set up uh, so that I do not hear myself because I prefer not to hear myself being an old radio guy. I've asked Suzanne to um, track comments in the chat. So if you have comments or on clarities or questions, please put them in the chat and I will I will trust I will rely upon my friend Suzanne to find the moment to interrupt my monologue and and put those forward. I'd really be happy to hear from all of you. So my name is Chris Smith. I'm professor and chair of musicology uh, here at Texas Tech. I've been here since the fall of 2000. In addition to serving, <coughs> excuse me, in addition to serving as chair of musicology, I'm also the founding director of the Vernacular Music Center, which is a center for research, teaching, and advocacy in the world's vernacular musics. That is, musics and dance that are learned and taught and passed on by ear and in memory. The VMC presents uh, concerts and workshops and master classes and various forms of educational resource and activities, but also very crucially, we engage in teaching classes. And so the VMC is this kind of umbrella organization that sponsors all of these activities in the world's oral and oral tradition musics, musics learned and taught and passed on by ear and in the memory. Uh, the VMC is also entirely unfunded. It is not part of my teaching load and the VMC controls no budget. We have always been project based, which meant that we have, we've had good support from our directors, thank goodness, uh, but it's project to project to project. Uh, those of you who are budget managers will appreciate there's a certain silver lining to not controlling a budget, just selling the, uh, being a freelancer and selling the value of, of each individual project. Um, having said that, it also means that the VMC has pursued and really of necessity, a very light footprint in terms of costs and in terms of technology. And I learned many years ago from a friend of mine who I met because he sat next to me at JNB Coffee for years from the business school about the, the power of the free social media tools. And so almost everything that we do is light footprint, uh, heavily oriented toward economy and permutatability. And especially, and this is something I'll come back to, meeting our audiences where they are meeting our audiences of consumers, whether it's in the concert hall or in the teaching studio or in the social media space, using the platforms they use. So not relying on a, social, a single social media platform, but recognizing that all of these different platforms, which permutate even faster than old guy cannot, than I, like I can keep up with, recognizing that each of those have their own devotees and trying to find ways to manage streams that do all of, that, that, that reach those diverse audiences, not all of which overlap. Like all of us, um, back in March, in the before times, there was a, a growing, looming realization just before spring break that we were probably going to have to pivot, that we we're going to be online for some period of time, although I don't know who of us perhaps imagined how long that might be, but we did, a lot of us knew that was coming, and we all of us in our own ways tried to prep for that, uh, get up to speed, whatever that means, to whatever extent we could. I've got some materials that I will share through with um, my friends at the TLPDC and they can make them available in the, in the notes for this. Um, but for example, just as an example of the kind of thing I think we all did, I didn't know much about Zoom, although I'd used it some, but I ran a series of Zoom salons for my colleagues during the extended spring break where I basically said, okay, we don't, most of us know much about Zoom. Let's all get in the space together and begin to figure out what it can do. Now, everybody in this Zoom room today at this point is a virtuoso Zoom user compared to I, where I was at in March of the before times. Um, likewise, I started putting together online playlists of resources because one of the things that's become very apparent to me, continues to be made apparent to me and all, at all kinds of different levels is that online learning is always self-generated. Even if the online learning is material which we are requiring of our students enrolled in our classes, it is still self-generated because we can't make them access that material. 
and it kind of changed how I thought about online presentation. And it, I think, perhaps made me feel kind of liberated to employ uh, skills and tools that I already knew, especially from uh, the world of public radio, which I did for years, and various forms of presenting organizations, to take skill sets that were simple and light footprint and easily acquired and use them to present content in which I was expert. We're all expert in the content that we teach. And so thinking about online teaching and online outreach, I, I concluded that it was best if I kept my workflow simple, predictable, my technology footprint, my technology expertise, very modest, because it was the content that sold the, the, the object. What I had to offer was not about how slick it looked, although I'm very impressed by people who are good with iMovie, for example. It was about the content and creating content and making the content available in a fashion that encouraged buy-in from the consumer, whether it was somebody I was trying to reach for outreach or a student who I was trying to persuade to view the necessary lectures. So that's kind of what I'm thinking about today is how I can share those kinds of resources. Uh, I'm going to I'll just, in the interest of full transparency, and since my friend Suzanne has given me sharing privileges, I'm going to just share my own notes. These are the, not just notes I made for myself. What I basically intend to do is to spend a little bit of time showing you what we concluded, and then I want to do a demo. I want to do a walkthrough of producing, of creating a creating a simple podcast. Um, if you want to, you can kind of think of this as looking over the shoulder of a person younger than I and watching how they do something. Like, I don't try to learn a new phone's operating system. I get someone younger than I to show me. How, here's how it works, right? Because I think of that, actually, if I want to use that kind of language, it's project-based learning. I don't need to know everything about Zoom. I need to know about Zoom what I need to know in order to make it do what I need it to do. I think back to the days of Blackboard and before that of WebCT. I don't need to know everything that WebCT can do because it's so it was so bloody clunky. I just need to know what can it do that I need to know. I also think that's the way that many of our students of every different kind of cohort learn. They learn by demonstration and imitation. So that's kind of what I propose to do today. Um, the VMC was recruited by our friend, Dr. Michael Borshuk of the Humanities Center. He was, Michael was recently, I can't even remember when, I think it was April or May, he was writing a major grant to the, to the NEH. And the particular theme of the grant was how to pivot material which has traditionally been delivered online, or excuse me, traditionally been delivered face-to-face -face in real space, right, to uh, digital content. And so I... I, Mike asked me, he said, do you have stuff from the VMC that, that you could share? I'm going to share my whole screen now. And I said, well, yeah, Mike, actually, as a matter of fact, we do. Um, and I've just identified the six types of content that I said to Mike, I think we can do the following things. These are things we're already talking about doing, realizing that we've had to, uh, we're going to have to make this pivot. And here are the things that, we've, that we're going to, we're going to try to be producing. So Mike said, could you please share that with me? I'm minimizing various things on my screen because I really want you to be able to see my whole screen. So this is a playlist. I'll share this in the show notes afterwards. But what, what I have in this playlist, and I'm not going to take you through all of them, is samples of each of these six different kinds of materials. Now, these are materials that are specific to a performing arts organization like mine, performing arts teaching and advocacy. But I would like to think that these are all types of materials which no matter your discipline, STEM or humanities or fine arts or and across the disciplines, these are all materials of a sort that your content could inhabit. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. I'm doing trailers about teaching music. You might be doing trailers about teaching organic, organic chemistry. I'm doing short informational podcasts about my own research in American vernacular music. You might be doing a short informational podcast about your approach to English literary criticism and so on and so forth. So just as an example, I'm not, and as I say, I'm not going to take you through these, although I will make the link to the playlist available in this, these free tools, which my friend Lynn Humphrey insisted that we had to start learning a video trailer of a minute.
Hello. Okay. Chris Smith talks about world music for one minute and four seconds for a class. At Texas Tech University. That's it. I'm a Windows person, not a Mac person, so I couldn't use uh, iMovie. I used another program, but I kept this as simple as I could possibly make it. I didn't go for fancy backgrounds. I didn't go for fancy graphics. I wanted a student, a prospective student who I was trying to recruit for this class. I wanted the student to say, oh, that's what it would be like to have this guy on my Zoom screen, right? Here's a trailer that's a minute and 13 seconds. Hello. Same deal. Yeah, because my observation and experience with students at uh, students, and I think this is this is accurate, is that short chunks of material, which contain only as much as they need to know in order to engage their buy in are useful. So those are examples of trailers. Uh, I'm going to play a slightly longer item here. This is uh, the second category identified short informational podcasts. This is something that we were actually considering doing before COVID hit, before we knew that we were going to have to pivot. And I thought, I'm going to take a small chunk of my own expertise and present it in a form which, as either audio or audio video, would be appealing and accessible. I'm going to unshare just for a second because I want to see your faces. Um, podcast consumers in the house, podcast consumers, raise your hand. Let me see your hand. Yeah. I was not for years, right? And I'm like, I'm too old for that. I, you know, but, but I realized a friend of mine said, oh, you know what? If you get addicted to podcasts, then that will make you exercise every day. And I'm like, damn it, he's right. Don't think about it as walking. Think about it as time to listen to podcasts. And I'm like, damn it, he's right. But it was actually, although I'm making a joke about it, it was actually an incredible insight because I realized that's a mode of consumption which is entirely based upon attention to narratives. And a kind of light bulb went on in my old public radio head. And I thought attention to narratives. So whether it's a minute long or five minutes long or 42 minutes long or 20 minutes long, attention to narratives. Narratives are in my world. Narratives help sell the content, telling stories. It's not the only way, but it's a way that felt very familiar. Yes, please, Erica. Chris, this is so true. I, um, I'm i dyslexic, so I listen to a lot of things, and I love yeah. podcasts because I love, yeah. and I found that um, nonfiction books, it's harder for me to listen to because I don't have the narrative arc to follow. Yeah. And so I think that's why I enjoy podcasts so much because it's usually got a really good beginning, middle, and end. And yeah. it, and you can, you I don't know, I can spend all day listening to them. I love it. Yeah, and I think I think there are a lot of different reasons that people become fans of a certain uh, media object. But my observation as someone who wasn't a podcast person was, oh, this is, oh, okay. There's a mode of consum uh, consuming information, consuming especially nonfiction information, which is profoundly attractive to a very wide diversity of people. So it got me thinking, how can I produce such content with a light footprint, minimal technological complexity and maximizing the con maximizing focus upon the content that I already know. And that's going to be, that's something I'm going to strike. I'm going to say maybe rather redundantly that all what I'm, what I'm describing, what I am advocating for is presenting content you already know. It is not necessary to learn lots of new stuff and it is only necessary to learn enough, um, technological expertise to get the content in front of the ears and eyes of your of your um, consumer. So premise that we all have the content and teaching expertise already. We're already experts in our fields. We are already committed pedagogues. Hypothesis that new delivery methods like the web or Zoom or a podcast are only that. They are only delivery methods. They need not demand different content. Conclusion. This is something that I reached a long time ago. Uh, light footprint and intuitive workflow are your friends. For example, you don't need this. That's a photo of my desk. And if you want to be a geared dweeb, I can take you to it, but I don't need to. What you need is that. I learned a long time ago, I concluded, I should say, a long time ago, 
that if I was going to be able to work productively in the small chunks, which are all that's available in the schedules of an academic, I had to be able to get into an office head space anywhere quickly. So I had two items. I got a laptop and I, I need a laptop and noise canceling headphones and I'm good. When I got to thinking about producing all digital content, I tried to hold on to keep the tech footprint really light, streamline the workflow and maximize the, and thereby maximize the focus of attention upon the content. So continuing to share. So longer instructional videos, I, I'm going to let this, as I say, I'm going to let this play a little bit longer. And I, if I may, I'm going to, going to in, pr, kind of provide you a thought question. I won't make you sit through the whole six minutes of it. But I want to provide you a thought question. And here's the thought question. Even if you're not a performing arts person or a humanities person, whatever is your teaching content, can you imagine a particular topic, a portion of a lecture, maybe something, a section from your introductory lecture, an open opening couple of days of class lecture, which you could present in six minutes in a fashion which would engage and empower? Because if you engage and empower, I think the consumer, forgive me for using that word, but it's the right word, the consumer is drawn in if you engage and you empower. So there's a word that we use in the vernacular music, a phrase we use in the vernacular music center because we play, as my friend Chase Olivier will know, we play a lot of strange instruments in the vernacular music center. So we describe these presentations as um, the VMC petting zoo, where we say, here's this weird instrument. Want to come up and pat it like that? Okay, so this is this is the virtual VMC pet the, the VMC virtual petting zoo for and forgive me friends, my friend Suzanne invited me. That means you have to listen to the banjo. Just about two minutes. That is about as low tech presentation as you can get, right? It's a fixed camera and a boring background. But it starts with something that engages. Hello, I'm Chris Smith. Professor and Chair Same of Music Ecology and Founding Director of the Vernacular Music Center at the Texas Tech University School. Can you tell I've given that spiel a lot? That's helpful. What we mean is music or dance that are learned and taught and passed on by ear and in a memory. Oftentimes that's by demonstration and imitation. Someone shows you how to- So I'm gonna pause that because I'm allowed to interrupt myself and say, we all have spiels we give. We give them because they work and because we know, look, I'm in a new presentation. Hi, my name is Chris Smith. I'm professor and chair of musicology and director of the Vernacular Music Center, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We all do that. That is valuable content, which immediately contextualizes, engages, and empowers. This is who I am. Welcome to my world for six minutes, right? the Atlantic coasts of Georgia and South Carolina and the Sea Islands. And so- All I'm doing in six minutes and 40 seconds is saying, is saying, here's a sample of the teaching world that I occupy. Now, it could be any topic. I believe it could be any topic. My friend Angela could be talking about ethics in sport and say, here's an example of how it works in my world. My friend, Dr. Matt Santa could be talking about, here's how voice leading works, right? Whatever it is that you teach, it's content you, in which you're already expert. We are simply thinking about a format, a mode, a frame into which to place this content. And in terms of workflow and productivity and avoiding having the technology becoming the tail that wags the horse, right? Keeping that workflow simple. So longer instructional videos. Um, I did a whole series. I won't even play any of them. I'll just show them to you. These are, I kind of went crazy in the sort of video podcast uh, mode. And I did, let's see what I did. 
an in, a five minute introduction to how a placement exam works. A mini lecture on one of the courses I was teaching. A follow up and another follow up. A full flip lecture of 42 minutes. Probably a lot of us are already presenting conference papers and learning to be video editors, right? We're having to do that if we're attending virtual conferences. Um, I don't know about you folks. When I first encountered a conference that said, you must submit your, your conference presentation as a full length video in advance, I'm like, are you kidding me? I rewrite my conference paper the night before I give it. Maybe I rewrite it on the podium. How do you, you know, I had that whole response. But then I got into it and I thought, wow, this is a whole different medium. Maybe I should just let it be a different medium. So play the first 15 seconds. Down, Whoops, I'm sorry. My presentation is entitled Music, Dance, and the Iconography of Cultural Exchange on the Antebellum Upper Mississippi. I'd like simply to begin. So that's a kind of that's the kind of thing that any of us might say is a conference presentation. But I got a little further into it and realized, well, I could actually kind of use some of my public radio skills. The Mississippi, from the Ojibwe, Mississippi, the Big River, has been a critical avenue for trade and exchange for as long as indigenous people and then settler people have occupied North America. And it's so all I did there was I said, okay, here's, this is what I would do if I was standing up at the conference podium and talking. But then I thought, wait, I could have, I could fly in bits of soundtrack, like the kind of thing I would do at the conference podium if I had those kinds of resources. Yeah? Does that make sense to everybody? Uh, and all of us will have that, the, have those kinds of references, things we'd say, if only we could, or if only I could. So no part of this, and in, in no part of this am I suggesting that it's necessary that we maximize our gear headedness, right? I'm a working musician, and so I have lots of gear that I just repurposed, yeah? But work, what workflow doesn't need is the technology horse wagging, or the technology tail wagging the dog. Does that seem reasonable? Um, Suzanne, I, I'm seeing things come in the chat. My friend Suzanne had said she would uh, monitor the chat for me. Are there things that, that maybe we could- You're speak doing to? good. Okay. Just we comment. Right? Okay. Yeah, you're okay. 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 Very good. So I'm just going to, I'm going to press on, but um, because you're all being so nice about this, I can actually kind of move toward uh, a pretty, pretty immediately into a demo, right? This is, uh, forgive me for speaking in terms of axioms, but I'm going to give you an, an axiom that I use. Employ and find new avenues with which to share the unique content you already possess. None of us needs to learn over again how to teach our content. We don't need to. We simply need to find a mode of, of capturing that content, which is sufficiently straightforward, that we feel good about it. Like, yeah, that captured what I need to do. Right, that captures like the things I just showed you. Yeah, I thought that maybe what we could do near the end of this time is walk through an example, create a podcast together, and I just show you what I did. You can kind of look over my shoulders if I was a fourteen-year-old teaching me my new Android operating system. So a few axioms. I can talk about hardware. I can do that nerdy tech thing, but I would rather just share it with you in the chat or share it with you in the show notes, right? It's there, it's accessible for you if you wanna make use of it. Um, but I don't think it's necessary. The two things I would say are necessary for creating either a video or audio podcast, okay? Are some kind of editing software, which could be as simple as something that lets, just you, trim, lets you trim the beginning end of something, a decent webcam and a decent microphone. This webcam that I'm using right now is a green extreme and it cost me about 39 bucks on uh, Newegg or something like that. This microphone is, a, is an ATM 2020, which cost me about a hundred bucks about 15 years ago because I use it as a stage mic. But these two tools, the webcam that I'm pointing at, at the above my laptop and the microphone provide a sense of immediacy. And that's really all I need, okay? And probably, and again, I'm sure that these are all things that we mostly all know anyway. Really, the only reason I'm saying this right now is to say you don't need all the other stuff, at least not right now. So I thought maybe we could do a bit of a walkthrough on Webflow or a, a, a walkthrough on Workflow. Um, 
before we do that, does anybody have any comments they want to make or that kind of thing? Are there stuff you want to you want to come at me and argue? You're leaving out this or that, or you're wrong, totally wrong about X or Y. Okay, a question I'm, for you. I'm sorry. Go ahead, please. I'm curious about you know you're creating these things like you have these wonderful YouTube videos. How yeah. are you getting them to students? Okay. Like to new audiences. Okay. I'll give a short three, three bullet point answer. First, I, I use the free tools. My axiom is use the free tools, right? Meet them on the platforms they already employ. Now, if I was a heavy duty Instagram user, I would certainly be posting them to Instagram as well, subject to copyright usage. But I'm not a heavy Instagram user and I'm not going to learn Instagram for that purpose. I just, it's not practical. Uh, Suzanne, I think Suzanne knows that uh, one or two of you, of you may know that along about the middle of March, when I was feeling really isolated in my house in Lubbock, I just started doing a nightly God help us, uh, Facebook stream from my front porch playing the banjo because I didn't feel like my neighbors had enough to deal with. I felt like my neighbors should have to hear me playing the banjo as well. I'm making a joke, of course, but I did it from my own head because I thought I'm not hearing any human sound. I, I can't. I, you know, so I would just, I just went out there and, and just started playing the banjo and I would do it every evening on the same evening. And then I started streaming it. Right. And I did not want to have to learn anything about streaming. So I thought, oh, okay, I know how to use Facebook live. I'm just going to put the, put the phone up in a $6 tripod, tripod facing away from me. Thank you very much. And play the banjo. And I, and I just, I got, I, I maintained that I think from mid-March until after Labor Day, even when I had traveled across the country, even when I was traveling across the country. Because there weren't a lot of people who were listening, but for the people who were listening, it actually became really important. It was important for me, right? I didn't know what day of the week it was, but I knew where I had to be at 8 p.m. Central Time, right? That kind of light footprintness of, you know, I had an, I had an Android phone in a $6 tripod, and I just hit on Facebook Live and stopped thinking about it, right? Because it wasn't about the slickness of the mode. It was about the content, whatever unique content. So YouTube, Facebook Live, I am swearing you all to FERPA secrecy, okay? Right now. I share the cloud recordings of my Zoom classes with the students in that class. I just record the Zoom to the Zoom cloud and in every, after each class, I send a follow-up email and I say, here's the link to the cloud. It's only going to be there for a week anyway, and then Zoom is going to take it down. But I have lots of students, as I'm sure has happened for a lot of us, who cannot be there at the scheduled time, the synchronous time. They can't. Or maybe they need another pass through the material, or they retain better, or they want to use it for studying. Yeah. So I make use of, of, of the Zoom cloud. I make use of the free tools and make use of the tools that we are, that, that actually already belong to us, right? That, to which we already have access. Yeah. Did that answer your question, Suzanne? Okay. So let me, let me just, are there any other questions or comments or queries? Yes, Ken, please. Sorry. Ken, I can't hear you. I think you're muted, son. Ken. They, Can you do you? Are you muted? I can't unmute you from myself. Yes, we can. Go ahead, please. Sorry about that. So YouTube and podcasts are super, super polished um, with a lot of folks that have very questionable content, which is kind of exa exactly opposite of what you're talking about. Don't worry about making it too polished. Don't you? Don't be a gear nerd. Don't do this. Don't do that. It's all about the content. But then you see a lot of these you know, bloggers that are making gazillions of dollars, uh, you know, and drawing in huge audiences that have questionable content, but super polished product. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that? That's not our mission, is it? Our mission is not to generate a million clicks. Our mission is to generate engagement from a target audience, targeted audiences. Yeah. And I'd flip that. That's a great question, Ken. And I would flip it again and say, what things go viral? There's a whole lot of stuff that goes viral on Instagram or YouTube or Facebook, which is a grade Z cell phone recording, but it's gone viral because of the content. Sadly, in our surveillance world, 
it is too often horrific co content. But sometimes when we all need it, it's just somebody playing with puppies. And we go, wow, that was recorded on a grade Z cell phone and it's got a million clicks because it elicited engagement. So Ken, I, I would put forth that our, our, we are not generating content in order to generate revenue. We're generating content in order to generate engagement from certain targeted audiences. Does that seem like a reasonable response? Okay. Um, any other comments or questions? Anybody wants to, uh, uh, objections? Anybody wants to interject? I make it 31 minutes after the hour right now. And I know Suzanne asked me to leave time for comments or questions. Okay. Feel free to drop them in the chat. I, I, I'm going to go ahead and I'm just going to kind of give an example of a, me a, me a method I stumbled upon for doing either audio or video podcasts. I'm involved in some podcasting now. I'm working on a book with a friend of mine in the UK, and we're using some of the commercial podcast production platforms. I actually have a, I think I have a, an image of one such in, in my slideshow. Let me just check ahead. I'm going to share my whole screen. No, I don't have it in my, it's, it's a, it's a, a tool called Squadcast. And uh, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to demonstrate it to you, but I'm going to kind of, I'm going to log into it. And then I'm going to talk about why, uh, how I think it's useful. This is a tool that records audio, but in the process of recording shows both video and audio. So when we go into one of these sessions, if I log into one of these sessions, what Squadcast will capture is the audio, the high quality audio. You see my face, sorry for that, in low resolution because it's using my other webcam. But the only reason that it is capturing that, the, the only reason that it is streaming that video at all is so that my interlocutor can see my face. So it doesn't save the, the, the video. It saves only the audio, but it provides us the video so that we're having a conversation. So that my, I myself at 11, a, 11 a.m. on a Friday and my friend Tom in Southampton in the UK at 5 p.m. Greenwich time in the UK, we're seeing each other. And the video will disappear. And that way we, we're using very little bandwidth, right? Because it's just capturing audio, but it's capturing high resolution audio suitable for podcasting or squad casting. So such tools exist. But further, the question that Ken asked, I, I'm, that's even more high tech than I'm being for any of my students, right? I mean, my, my, <laughs> maybe I'm a bad advocate because my ideal is I'm going to sit down and turn on Facebook Live and play the banjo for 45 minutes and then not have to think about it anymore right? And yet the content is captured, something I already know how to do. All right, so maybe I could just kind of take us through this two-step process, this demo. This is a two-stage process that I'm, this is what I've done, a method that I've developed for uh, turning known lectures into podcasts. Use voice to text to yield the script, and I'm going to demonstrate that, and then use that script to yield the podcast. Here's something I would say as a long time, as an old radio microphone dog, don't improvise the voiceover for a podcast because it's too hard to engineer and also speak persuasively at the same time. I did it for 15 years in public radio and I can't do it. So instead, here's what I do. Can everybody see my full desktop? Yeah, by the way, behind you all, <laughs> I have, the, this is just a bit of levity. Some of you will recognize that room. My music students see that room, which is our Hemley Recital Hall, and they get really teary because we all want to be in Hemley Hall, right? Okay. So here's an example. So my, my goal is, because I'm a public radio person, I want to generate a script for myself because if I have a script, then it will take away some of my infelicities and allow me to split my attention on the engineering. So this is just, I'm an MS Word person. If you, this is not your, your uh, word processing program, others will work. So here comes a demo.
Okay. In this sample podcast, comma, we are going to collectively author a script which, when captured, comma, and suitably edited, comma, can provide the reading script as we engineer the audio capture, period. In this particular case, comma, we are talking about streamlined and light-footed workflow practices, comma, which center the unique content which we as educators already know and with which we are experienced in delivery, period. By using voice-to-text within this particular word processing program, comma, I am capturing a lecture I have given many times before, comma, but now turning it into a piece of prose, period. I can then save that piece of prose, comma, open my audio capture program, comma, and use this as a script in the form of a radio script, comma, in order to generate a polished audio prose exposition, period. I don't know if any of you guys use voice to text for grading or commenting. It's been transformative for me. Uh, let me just, if I could ask, just give me a show of hands. How many of you have a spiel you've given a lot of times before? Probably most of us, right? If you had a, pro a capture program, could you capture your spiel? Yeah? Now, so that's, that's, that's as much of a script. Now, obviously, this is maybe a 90-second script, maybe shorter, right? That's all. So now I'm going to open a different program. I'm going to open a different audio capture program, and there's a zillion of them. You can even do these on your phone, for gracious sakes. You can get Squadcast on your iPhone. And I'm simply going to use that as the script that focuses and polishes my verbal exposition so that I can also be concentrating on capturing audio. This is a particular, sorry, that's not the one I want. Uh, this is the one I want. This is a free program that I use for those of you who are serious, uh, serious audio files. This is approximate, this is a free version of the program called Cool Edit. It's called Audacity. It's ubiquitous. All right, so Audacity is going to capture what I'm sending into my microphone. Yeah, as audio. This is if I'm doing, my friend in the UK and I, we, we describe two kinds of podcasts. There's single guy ruminating podcast, a la This American Life. And there's two blokes chatting, a la Car Talk with Tom and Ray Maliazzi. Those are the, those are the, the, the podcast models that I like. One guy, excuse me for the gender specific language, because but too often it's a guy like me, right? Ruminating or two blokes talking like the Kitchen Sisters, okay? All right, so here's, this is, this is one guy ruminating, okay? Demo of Lecture to Podcast. In this sample podcast, we are going to collectively author a script which, when captured and suitably edited, can provide the reading script as we engineer the audio capture. In this particular case, we're talking about streamlined and light-footed workflow practices, which center the unique content which we as educators already know and with which we are experienced in delivery. By using voice-to-text within this particular word processing program, I'm capturing a lecture I've given many times before, but now turning it into a piece of prose. I can then save that piece of prose, open my audio capture program, and use this as a script in the form of a radio script in order to generate a polished audio prose exposition. Done. 50 seconds. Demo of Lecture to Podcast. In this sample podcast, we are going to collectively author a script which, when captured and suitably edited, can provide the reading script as we engineer the audio capture. Now, that's what I would do if I was trying to do a straight up audio podcast, right? 
I might do something like that. And again, I'm not trying to generate new content. I know the content. I know the content cold. I'm simply trying to develop a very streamlined, light-footed, intuitive, do it the same way every time, way of turning it from verbal exposition into printed prose into audio. Yeah? I could do it extemporaneously, but it probably wouldn't be as polished. And oh, by the way, if you have lectures, which you or sp otherwise spiels you've given many times before, maybe it's worth having them in a printed prose form anyway. If you are concerned about accessibility issues, then you can do the same thing, same kind of thing, only using PowerPoint as your capture method, right? I'm going to use PowerPoint. I'm going to record a narration. I think that's what PowerPoint calls it. Record slideshow, that's what it calls it. Okay. Yeah, they, it's, it's not liking the fact that I'm using my webcam for Zoom. However, it is possible in PowerPoint, to, it, it's possible to set PowerPoint to record and close caption. How many of you know that? Yeah. PowerPoint will record audio or video, as you know, but it will also provide closed captioning. We established that in a previous thing I did for TLPDC. I think it's under slideshow, maybe. Yes, always use subtitles. See where it says always use subtitles. So for example, How can we develop content for students, including those in rural and underserved populations who may not have access to the same resources as others, right? E.g., if we're worried about accessibility, closed captioning, there are various programs, including PowerPoint, which will do that closed captioning automatically and then save it. And then this can be output as a video file and uploaded to Blackboard or to YouTube or to another uh, cloud-based resource. Does that make sense to everybody? In all cases, and I'm going to unshare my screen now because I'm sure you're you've seen quite enough of that. In all of these cases, what I'm trying to, the, the precept I'm trying to hold on to is A, I already have the content. I probably am quite polished at presenting that content in a live space in the before times. So what I need to do is to find ways, both technological, hardware, hardware software, and procedural methods that enhance my capacity to capture with a high degree of fluidity, a minimum level of technological nerdity, and a, and a relative degree of speed. That's what I got. 4.43 in, in my world. It's 443 p.m. in the North Berkshires. It's almost happy hour. Uh, Suzanne? Chris, I threw a um, tutorial in the chat that after the Burns conference, when so many folks were enamored with your voice capture in PowerPoint, we put together a quick tutorial. So that's Fantastic. a one page um, tip sheet, if you will, um, that will show uh, folks how to do that. Fantastic. So just in case anyone was stuck there. One thing I was curious about, Chris, is um, you have a very different speech pattern when you um, are capturing uh, your speech, like in Word or something. And then yeah. obviously when you're speaking, preparing that podcast, how did you teach yourself to do that? And what are your tips to others? I have a two-part two answer. I have the one that works for me, which dates me. And I have one which I think will work for almost everyone. The one that I have for me that works for me is having done public radio for so many years, which is not, it's like, okay, fine old guy, I didn't do public radio, what do I do? Think about how youngsters use voice to text. I'll give you an example. I'm convinced that voice to text on social media is both a great boon and a great bane because I happen to be in a close social relationship with someone who uses voice to text, let's just say, in a highly stream of consciousness fashion. And I'm looking at, I'm looking at a social, at social media messaging and there are six and seven and eight screens long. And I'm like, this is just like having a conversation with you. 
But if you think about how a youngster, one of our youngsters, and I say youngsters because everybody in the world is younger than I, okay? If you think about how our friends and neighbors who are familiar with cell phones, how they were, I know you can't see the screen, but I've just opened up a text note and I've hit the record function in Evernote. And I am responding to Suzanne's question regarding how I developed the particular inflections, comma, and orthography, comma, necessary to minimize typographical errors in voice to text usage, period. I'm kind of making a joke here. So what I would say is, my webcam is completely freaked out now, right? What I would say is, I'll turn it off and turn it on. Look to existing models for voice to text. If you're someone who uses voice to text on your phone, use that model. If you need to practice a bit and learn to say, for example, um, MS Word, you have to tell it every single type of uh, punctuation. You have to tell it comma, period, semicolon, etc. However, PowerPoint, the closed captioning power on PowerPoint, it's got an unbelievably effective punctuation algorithm. And it will sense period versus comma versus semicolon, literally based upon your, your speed of your, your uh, pace of speech. So you have to do a little bit of learning. But if I'm just trying to generate a script, if nobody's going to read that text except myself, and I know what I said, it doesn't really matter whether it's full of typographical errors anyway. It's just I'm not having to improvise it anymore. So I'm saying it's actually quicker. I, I'm, I'm, because I'm an old public radio person, I have a real pet peeve about badly produced audio. Now, further to Ken's question, I don't mean it has to sound like a, somebody with a million-dollar podcasting studio. But I mean, it doesn't want to sound like two blokes talking like who are like in their basement sharing inside jokes. We're teachers. We're professional pre presenters. We know how to speak in an expository, engaging, accessible, empowering narrative fashion. All I'm talking about doing is finding a streamlined workflow and light footprint tools that let us capture that stuff in this new medium. I gotta reset my webcam again, sorry. Any other questions or comments from anybody? Uh, okay, so I have a question, then I'll ask a question of you folks. Is this what you thought it would be or is it something other than what you thought it would be? Okay. Session? Yeah. I don't know that I had an expectation. That's fair. Can you find holes in these models? Can you poke holes in these models? Or is anybody feeling like, okay, you say you do this, but yeah, but that won't work for me because X, Y, or Z. I think if there was a takeaway, the takeaway would be, don't make the technology the focus. I think there's always gonna be people that are gonna come from the, this isn't gonna work in my class, uh, you know, area. Yeah. And, and, and I think that that's, that, that's not about you, that's about them. <laughs> I think yeah. that, that sometimes they, they're just, they wanna put up barriers and they're not looking for ways to, to make it work. They're looking for ways for excuses that it doesn't, mm -hmm. I would say. Sure. And, and I, would, I, I would certainly take that point, Ken. And I would say any one of us, any of our colleagues is, should get all kinds of space to be able to say, I'm sorry, it's a pandemic. I'm not sure that I can, I can quite take this on as well. But for those of us who, who would like to believe that there's an opportunity here, Really, uh, that's who I think we're all kind of speaking to, an opportunity not to make it as if it was your class, 
Like I would, I wouldn't say to one of my colleagues, "Oh, what do you mean you can't do a podcast about organic chemistry? What's the matter with you?" Right? But I might say, you know, I might just come back to those same sort of precepts. You have expertise. You have experience. You have the content, and you have it at a very, very high level. So I, I've got, I've got having some internet connectivity problems. So if I suddenly blink out, it's not because I tried to. Chris, there's a question in the chat from Twyla, and she asks, are there other speech to text option, options that provide a more intuitive punctuation function like PowerPoint? You know, Twyla, that's a great question. And I haven't really followed up on it because as I said at the beginning, I'm sort of using the tools that work for me, right? Erica, sorry. I use it on a Mac. Um, you can set it up under your accessibility features um, along with listening to text back to you. I use that feature a lot. And you have to put in all, like you would on your iPhone, all um, punctuation. Um, a workaround to that is that I also use Grammarly. So if you're not great at punctuation, you could do your text to talk and then plop it in Grammarly. I do that often as well. Yeah, there was a period. Thank you for that, Erica. There was a period, Twyla. There was a period before I had before I had the most recent version of Office three sixty five, which is the one that has the voice to text dictation, where I would literally speak it into Evernote on my phone, and then Evernote saves to the cloud. So at least I could block and paste from Evernote into whatever document I was uh, I was editing. I do that. I, I I don't do that so much anymore because the um, voice to text within MS Word is pretty good. I use that a lot because of the work that I do when I'm commenting upon student writing because I can have my hands on the keyboard and go control, comment, speak, control, comment, next speak, you know, et cetera, right? That, that's just, it speeds up that workflow. So a lot of this is stuff that I actually learned to do in commenting upon student writing before I thought of taking it into the podcast realm. Yeah, and I would just add that on a Mac, you can just, you can set up a key function. You can pick what it is. So mine is like tap command twice, and then yeah. that pops up. And yeah. so you, there's fairly quickly what quick ways to set up these commands and get them part of your yeah. routine. Yeah, it's like teaching Word or any other voice to text program to recognize unique vocabulary that's not in its database. Like Syncretic. It took me a while to teach Word how to rec to recognize the term syncretic, and now Word knows me and knows that that's what I'm saying. But Twyla, honestly, there, there's there's I don't I am not aware of any voice to text program which is completely intuitive. I th there is a learning curve there, and you have to learn to say comma and period. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Sure, it's a good question. How do, how do you teach it to uh, recognize a specific word, the dictation function? Um, in in MS Word, I, I'm not going to pull it up right now, Matt, but in MS Word, um, I have I evidently have more of a New England accent than MS Word quite recognizes because it keeps putting in long A's like that, right? Like a New England accent A, and it's thinking it's A-E or something like that. But as with unique words which you employ in MS Word, or unique terms in MS Word, which it sees as a misspelling, you can, there's a command in the, in the, the text-based version, there's a command you can say, add this vocabulary to my MS Word vocabulary. And once you've done that, you can do the same thing with voice to text. You can teach it, in other words, to recognize your pronunciation of a word, including an unfamiliar word. It's about, it's kind of like what Eric was saying. It's about building the database of what the program recognizes. Anybody else? Chris, any final thoughts as we wrap up our time? Uh, well, I said thanks to folks for showing up. Thanks from TOPDC and the Teaching Academy to TOPDC and the Teaching Academy. Um, I think I, I, I got no great insights except to say it's good that we, I think it's good that we remind one another that we're already expert presenters. We already are. And that if what we have to, that, that if what we have to face is um, 
how which keystrokes to hit in order to get MS Word to enact voice to text, or how to turn on closed captioning in PowerPoint, or how to tell it to closed caption into another language, which it will also do, or to learn to say comma, period, m dash, n dash. That's a relatively shallow learning curve whose dividend pays off pretty darned well. And I would the last thing I would loop it back to is the first thing I said, which is meeting your consumers where they are, meeting the TED Talk consumers where they, where they are, meeting the podcast consumers where they are, meeting the Instagram kids where they are. Because further to Ken's initial, uh, initial apt comment, they don't, uh, the people we're trying, the audiences we're trying to reach, they don't care about million dollar production values. They care about engaged and empowering content. And that's our wheelhouse, right friends? Chris, thank you so much. Thank you for your generosity with your time. Uh, so appreciate your perspective and, and uh, the axioms that you yep. shared okay. today with us. Good Musicologist, what can I say? Thanks, everybody. I really appreciate your participation. I hope it was useful and glad to see you here. And I hope you're all taking care. Yeah, taking care and locking down.